let me just quickly introduce myself a little bit. So I'm, I'm Rachel, I'm a British Canadian. Oh, there we go, I'm married to Tim. And we have two daughters who are now 18 and 16. And until, the, until about two years ago, we were living in Tanzania, in East Africa. We moved to Iringa, a place in the south there, um, in 2010. And we started out living in this little village called Magozi, um, just outside Iringa. Very basic, no running water, no electricity. That's our kitchen. Um, and that's my daughter there with her friends cooking tea. Um, so we were teaching people how to make and how to use these fuel efficient clay stoves. And that's what we started with and learning Swahili, learning how to live, how to cook. Um, alongside that, we started getting more involved in tree planting. Um, realizing the need to reduce um, the amount of fuel that people were using, but also make it possible to, to have more fuel. So we started tree planting, nutritional cooking, and we soon found out nutritional cooking reply, um, needed some nutritional planting. So we were doing kitchen gardens, and that got us into conservation agriculture. We realized very quickly that whatever we did out there had to start with agriculture. Everyone is a subsistence farmer. They rely on the soil to grow what they need for their family for the year. So we were doing a lot um, with conservation agriculture. And it was doing, we're working in very um, situations where it's very dry. The soil has just been so degraded. So yeah, we were working in very deforested areas. Um, and you can see every year, the yields of their crops are getting less and less. Um, and the region where we were just wasn't producing enough to feed itself. And so as we were working in agriculture, I just thought, wow, we need to incorporate beekeeping into what we're doing here. Um, now, I have to confess, I'm probably in a room full of beekeepers. I knew nothing about beekeeping. I didn't even know a beekeeper, and there were very few. I, I didn't know any there locally doing beekeeping. So I Googled um, and found top bar hives are the thing to do. So I contacted my friend, my carpenter friend, a Tanzanian guy, and said, could you make something that looks kind of like this? And he did. So we had a top bar hive, and I just put it up at the back of our house and nothing happened for like seven months, absolutely nothing. So I, I didn't have any wax or anything to bait it with. Um, somebody said, oh, you could try lemongrass. So we had loads of lemongrass, so I was putting lemongrass everywhere. Um, and the bees did arrive, okay, and it was a very exciting day. But then it was back to Google again, because I was like, well, what next? Um, you know, we started seeing all this comb, and I was like looking at the pictures. Is that, is that capped honey? Is that brood? Like, do I take that? What do I do? So um, I, there, I found out that there was going to be a beekeeping symposium in Arusha. So I was, that's fantastic. So I hopped on a bus. And it's like an 18 hour torturous ride, ridiculously hot, very bumpy, extremely uncomfortable. So 18 hours later, I arrived in Arusha and I was surrounded by beekeepers. Um, all the beekeepers in Tanzania had, had come for this and there also was Bees Abroad. And that's where I became connected with the charity Bees Abroad. I met John and Mary Home, who some of you may know, and asked them to help me. So they got me in touch with Julian Wilford, an Exmoor beekeeper, and he very kindly agreed to come out to Mwanza and teach me how to be a beekeeper alongside my Tanzanian friend uh, to train them to be trainers. So, um, and that was the beginning of my beekeeping adventures. And I don't think I had a clue at that time what I was getting myself in for, but have since become very addicted to that adrenaline rush that I've realized is part of African beekeeping. So meet some of my friends that I work with here. This is Mama Maria in the purple shirt. And as you can probably imagine, she's a very energetic, um, very passionate, very persevering mama. And she has become one of our really great beekeepers. And she lives in Malia, um, which is a, a village about 80 miles away from Mwanza City, where we were living at the time. And the village invited us to go. Um, they, had a, they had a church plot um, where they were planting trees and they wanted to know what they could do. How, what, and so they got in touch with us and we were like, this is perfect for bees, so let's, let's start a bee project. Um, so he, the pastor of that church was going around the village, finding anybody that was interested in learning how to become a beekeeper. And we said, make sure you get a good mix of people. And we did, we had a good mix of um, young, actually there's not very many people in the picture, there were about 20 of them, but young and old, we had men and we had women, 
And this for me was really exciting because traditionally in Tanzania, it's, it's a male activity to be, to be doing the beekeeping. Hives are often, they're always log hives, very high up in the tree, completely inaccessible for a woman wearing her you know, wrap, wrap skirt um, to be able to do anything. So, and also, uh, since then, we've got other projects, Bees Abroad are doing, like in Sierra Leone, working with amputees um, that have lost a limb in the Civil War there. And it's, again, making it accessible for them. It's bringing the, the top bar down to a height that's manageable. So um, I was also a bit of a novelty because there were no women beekeepers. So I, I was given the name Mama Nuki, which means Mama Bee. And, um, and I was the only one then, but now it's exciting to say there are lots of Mama Nukies, so everywhere doing beekeeping. So we had a, a, a two-day seminar with Julian. Julian came out, so he was teaching us, and I learned a whole new vocabulary in Swahili of all these words I had not known before. And we taught them how to, how to bait the hives, how to keep the hives. Um, we taught them how to make the hives. We worked with local carpenters. Um, and, and also beekeepers later too, but this was a local carpenter. Um, and he actually, this isn't Malia, this is a little bit later on. I, I, I don't have a picture of our first hives there, but they definitely didn't look as good as that. But this was a pretty nice one. Um, making these top bar hives is, is brilliant because you can use any locally available materials. So this one, he is using wood. I, I don't know if any of you have been to our stall, you'll see our little demonstration hive. You could use bamboo, they've been made with, with dung and clay and mud, um, using, using kind of reeds and raffia. You, you can use whatever you have to make that base and that box. And you can see there the shape of that one, that's a Tanzanian top bar, very square shape. Um, and we just found that worked very well for most of the people that we were working. The Kenyan top bar has the sloped angle sides. Again, it, it, it doesn't really matter. The bees are very happy. As long as you get that top bar correct, and that was what we needed to get exactly right. And most of these, if you look at the picture there, the carpenters um, are working with very basic tools, no power tools, nothing fancy, and often no measuring tape or anything. So what you can use is a, a beer bottle lid or a soda bottle lid, and that works just fine as a measuring guide. So you've, we really are trying to start where people are at. We want them to be able to make it. We want them to be able to source the materials so that they can then replicate it. They can take it and teach others and there's nothing, um, there's nothing preventing that, there's nothing in the way. So try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, so yeah, there's the finished top bars. So then we baited, uh, and then we taught the women how to make suits. Um, obviously there's no suits available where we are in the village, so we improvise, use a rice sack or a maize sack, and you might have seen that down on our stall. Um, downstairs, sewing out of sacks, very, very cheap. And it does work. It's brutally hot, which probably bothers me more than it bothers them, but um, it works. And since then, we've been able to work more with the seamstresses, and they, if they can get the cotton and the fabric, they can actually make some pretty good suits now. And trying to encourage them now to go broader, go wider in their market to sell these suits and make them more available for, for more beekeepers across the country. Um, oh, and that was some suits that the Basingstoke BKA donated, so that was a, a great gift. So there we are, baiting the hive, so an old baked bean tin comes in very useful, um, pouring the melted wax into the, the groove of the bar, and that's literally it. H hang it up in the tree and wait for the bees to arrive. And again, I waited seven months for mine, but sometimes it could take a couple of hours or anything in between, but it's just waiting for those bees to decide that that hive will make their home. So we started the group in Malia. We also started a group in Cayenze, another village, um, which was on the shores of Lake Victoria. And I remember we started there and I was talking, we were doing the initial training and I was talking about how important it was for the bees to have water. And completely, and we were putting pots of water around in Mali because it was so dry. Completely forgot that there's this ginormous lake, second largest in the world, just down the end of the path. So <laughs> the beekeeper kindly said, yeah, we, we've got plenty of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we were, um, Working with them, and then we just wait, wait um, for the excitement of when the bees arrive, and then wait for the excitement of when, when they start making honey. And it is, it's really exciting, especially working with such a group, and you're all kind of 
you know, on edge for it. Um, it gets a bit exciting now. The, it, the, the ride gets a little rougher. Rainy season comes, the roads get hard. It's much harder to get out there and A, to get to the villages. Um, I think I've got an example. When the rain would come, the road would just erode and disappear. So it's hard to get out there. And then even if you can get your land cruiser there, getting out to the hives is another thing again. But I remember um, another time we were, I was, it was at Mama Maria's, the picture there, and I had all the beekeepers um, in the Land Cruiser and we will all squish in as many because they all want to come and so you'd have like 10, 11 people all sort of squished in, hanging off the sides on the roof, whatever. You're just all in, in all your bee suits and it's, it's quite hot and squishy. Um, but we, would, we got out to where we could drive no farther. So we're, we're at the, her house, we're carrying it on foot. So we take our gear with us. We get to the hives um, and realize that one of the beekeepers had not kept his suit in the box as instructed and the rats had gotten in and chewed a hole in his veil. So we're not gonna be able to carry on with that. And I knew I had a spare veil in the Land Cruiser. Why I didn't take it, I don't know. Volunteered to go back and fetch it. So, and it was fine then, I could, see the, I could see the light of the house and I got back fine. Now my sense of direction is terrible, like really, really bad. And trying to get back to where the hives were in the bush, I complete, and it was dark, completely pitch dark, and I'm carrying all the suits and a couple extra buckets just in case. And I, again, why you start running when you don't know where you're going, I don't know, but I was like, I have to be quick. So I started running and then splash, I ended up in this like water hole up to, you know, up to my, hips in this murky water. Um, so anyway, I did scream, as you do, and thankfully the beekeepers heard me and shouted me the right direction. So there was a soggy evening trying to do all the beekeeping in my sodden suit. Um, but we did have many, many adventures. Um, we did do it at night. You can see here our nighttime beekeeping. We started doing it in the day, um, but you'll find there's so many there's so much going on. Um, even when you're out far in the bush, you'll have little boys taking their cows. Uh, you'll have chickens around. You'll have cows and goats. You'll maybe have girls going to fetch water. You'll be go they'll be going to get firewood. Anybody could be wandering around. And after we killed some chickens, um, when the, the, it was actually our beekeepers' chickens, the bees got very, as we say, defensive and um, attacked all their chickens. So I remember writing out the report for that project and you're, you're going through the budget and unexpected expenses and I had to say compensation for dead chickens. But yeah, so after that I decided it's probably better if we do it most of the time at night when the animals are all tucked safely away, children are <coughs> tucked away as well. And so we would use the red torch um, and it would be very calm usually and um, they'd all be fast asleep. So. That's our, but one night, I was telling somebody while we were waiting outside, we got to the hive and I just finished the talk on staying very calm and quiet and not making any, doing any fast movements, um, not shouting, and if anything happens, just slowly withdraw, don't run away. Um, finished all of that and then we took the lid off the top bar so there's a there's a sort of tin roof on the top of the top bars we taken that off and there lying on top of all the top bars there was a nest of snakes so there was a mama snake and all these other baby snakes so yeah chaos ensued as, as all the beekeepers were shrieking getting sticks and whacking sticks there were snakes flying through the air and it was yeah as noisy as could be um, and there, they did. They finally got all the snakes gone and killed and whatever. And at the time, I thought that baby snakes were not poisonous. But it was only after that that somebody said, oh, no, the baby ones are far more poisonous. So I was kind of glad I didn't know that when it happened. But um, so we had loads of them. I could talk for ages about all the crazy beekeeping adventures we have. But yeah, Willie's coming, so we have to keep going. But oh, yeah, there's, yeah, this was amazing. It doesn't look very exciting. But you try and take a photo in the dark when you're in the middle of a crazy snake um, adventure. And I was so proud that I actually did get one of the snakes in the shot. So if you can kind of see it, there is, there is a lot of snakes there. But yeah, again, trying to take photos with your gloves and yeah, it doesn't work, does it? So why beekeeping? beekeeping? I'm in danger now of completely putting you off anything to do with beekeeping in Africa. But I do hope that some of these crazy stories make you remember and think of what the benefits are. And believe me, there would have to be some benefits or I would have quit a long time ago. Um, 
So let's go through what some of those are. As I said, most of them are subsistence farmers. This lady's collecting her toma tomatoes, tomatoes. <laughs> and um, yeah, they live off the land. They don't have anything to risk. They, they have to get that bit of that, that crop in order to get through the whole year, um, putting food on the table. Um, there's not a lot extra for school costs, for school uniforms, school books, education. There's not a lot extra if children need medical attention. And the, and the, the, the amount of, the number of deaths you hear about from children, particularly under the age of five, from very curable, preventable diseases is tragic. But there's just, there's no margins. Um, so why do beekeeping? How can it help? Well, number one, it's fairly obvious, you, you're generating income through the selling of honey and wax. And that little bit of extra honey money, that can mean an awful lot. That could mean you could buy some chickens and then you could sell some eggs and then you could then buy a pig or you could buy a goat or you could buy a small piece of land and some seeds. You could grow vegetables and then sell the vegetables in the market. So it creates the, the, the ability to suddenly do something, something more. And people are so entrepreneurial, they'll grab every opportunity they can. Um, that means money that could be used for uniforms and books. So um, benefits for community collaboration. The benefit of doing things together as a group, um, sharing the learning, sharing the load of the work, sharing the money. A lot of our beekeepers and farmers groups would set up a village savings and loan scheme whereby they could put their honey, honey money in the pool, they could, they could contribute to their group fund, and then that enables them to take a loan out so they could start some other little project. So again, it's providing some capital to do something with. Um, crop pollination. Um, the bees pollinate the crops. You're increasing the yields. These are all subsistence farmers. Their hives are going in their fields. Um, and this picture here, this was Mama Marisiana. Um, this was a lady in Cayenne. She had a very small plot uh, where, she, where she grew her, her, her maize. And she had one tree in it. And some of you may have heard me tell this story at the stall. But this one tree in her garden, in her on her farm, they call it a shamba. She put the hive, okay? And then what happened? Loads of mangoes. The tree was full of mangoes. And everyone was walking by. Everyone from the village was just amazed. They were like, this tree has never had mangoes like this before. I've never seen this. She's like, it's my hive. I have a beehive. And she was so proud of this, this hive and so proud of her mangoes. She was selling mangoes, you know, on the side of the road, selling all her mangoes. And then she got another hive. So I think you can see there's two hives tucked under that tree. But then she's very excited. She planted the sunflowers. So again, you've got biodiversity happening. She started intercropping beans in between all her rows of maize. So immediately those beans are feeding the soil. You're getting more maize. And also the bees are pollinating the beans. So she's getting more beans. And you can just see one thing leads to another. And it's really exciting to see that. And it's, it's just lovely to see them get so excited about just the difference one small, one small thing can make. Um, health benefits. I probably can't get into this too much, but you all no doubt know all the health benefits of honey. How good is that? Um, and, and the wax as well. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit, some of the benefits of the, the wax. Um, tree planting and tree protection. Now here, we hear it all the time, don't we? On the news, um, scientists are always telling us about climate change and what we need to do and what a disaster it is. And we hear it all the time. You don't hear it over there. And they're not going to listen. If some, some scientist from another country said something about not cutting down a tree um, because of X, Y, Z for climate change and, and all of this, they wouldn't listen. It's not relevant to them. But they are bearing the brunt of everything that we do wrong here. And there's very little they can do about it. Um, but if you go to them and say, well, and actually this tree was saved because of the hive. The family were all trying to cut down this tree, this mango tree, for, um, for firewood. Um, they decided not to when they saw all the mangoes and they saw that this, this hive could produce honey. Now there's a reason to save that tree. There's a very tangible good reason. So they'll save the tree and they think too, I should plant another tree. And it then makes it very easy to do the, that kind of work. So yeah, huge incentive for tree planting. And elephants, um, which again I find incredibly fascinating and exciting, but elephants 
as probably most of you know here too, are terrified of bees. And there's been so many studies on this. Um, but yeah, if you put a bee fence up, um, so I, if you're downstairs at our stall, you'll see a big picture of a lady kind of very excited and waving. She's on the edge of the game park where elephants come into her shamba, her field, and they will destroy and eat a whole year's worth of food in one night. Um, they don't want the elephants there. They will kill the elephants. But if we can put a beehive um, fence up, so hanging hives on a wire across the boundary of, of, the, of the shambas, um, the elephant will knock into those wires, the hive starts swaying, the bees get annoyed, out they come, scare off the elephant. You've saved the elephant, you've saved the farm, you've also got the benefit of the honey and the wax, and the hive is in the farm, so you've got an extra yield from, from that space. It's just a win-win, it makes sense. So, yeah, that's another reason. So here, now we're teaching them how to process the honey. And there it's very easy, very simple, very basic. We've got a lovely um, comb there, just cut off the top bar. That then gets mashed up um, into a bucket, um, with a, cut up with a knife, break all the cappings, and then it's filtered through into a large bucket, and we've stuck a tap on the bottom. And then that's Julian, that's my, yeah, my introduction to beekeeping man there, um, and he's, He's helping us there get the honey out the bottom. Um, one of the problems we, we encountered, and as you've probably picked up, I'm learning all of this as we go. I, I'm not in any sense, you know, I didn't start as, well, definitely not an expert, but yeah, I've been learning as I go. And we very quickly realized it was quite hard to process the honey in the village. There's no safe space, bee-proof bee space. Everybody's got open windows, and that was quite tricky. So we were finding people struggling to find a place to, to process their honey without annoying all the neighbors. Um, so for a little while, we were bringing it back to town. We're saying we should set up a honey processing center where people can do it safely. And for quite a while, that ended up being my kitchen there, which didn't go down very well in the household. And I remember for several days, I would actually suit up to go and make supper. But yeah, it, it wasn't an ideal solution, but it was a temporary one. And I'll get to what we did do in a bit. But there we are, we got a press. And there you can see some of the different honeys. And this was ever so exciting to show the, the Tanzanian beekeepers. They'd never seen the different colors of honey. They'd only ever seen a very poor quality honey that had been scraped out of a log hive, which had bits of bee, bits of tree, bits of brood, bits of everything. And it, was, it fermented, it, it, it wasn't good. Um, and it's all very dark and colorless. And they'd never seen the variety. So suddenly we could show them, well, this is the really dark honey that, you know, from the acacia trees and and look at this one this is from Malia that's the cotton where the cotton farmers are that's and it was very creamy and set um, lovely honey and then there's this sort of in the middle one the mango honey and and they could suddenly see wow the difference between the different villages the difference at the different times of year and it was yeah it's fascinating isn't it um, and we taught them how to process the wax. Again, very simply, here's Bageshi. Um, he's, he's taken all the comb, popped it in the big souffaria pot, put it on the fire, um, boiled it up, and now he's pouring the hot water and melted wax through, that's filtering through to the bucket underneath. Um, and then you've got the, as the water cools, all that wax settling in a disc on the top of the bucket. And there you've got got the wax. And what we realized was this was a very unknown resource. Um, people did not know or appreciate the value of the wax. I would see uh, people just throwing away the comb and, and no, well, what are you going to do with it? So I realized we needed to show people what you could actually do with the beeswax. Um, uh, oh, there we are with our solar wax extractor as well. That worked really well there. I didn't think it would work here, actually. I thought it was far too cold, but somebody says it does actually work here. I have yet to really believe it, though. I'm always so cold. But anyway, um, there we are making our bombs. So we taught, uh, this is the women's group in Malia, that's Tabitha. Um, yeah, just setting up a fire outside. I know this goes against the grain when we were doing all these fuel-efficient stoves, and here we are on a three-stone fire, so apologies for that. But um, yeah, melting all that wax, mixing it. We've got lots of coconut oil there, so mixing with coconut oil. Um, and we did a lovely one with neem oil as well, which is very medicinal from the neem tree. 
And again, it's introducing people again to these things which they've known for, for years and years. I mean, the neem tree, they would break bits off the bark um, you know, for, for generations and use it to clean their teeth because they know that somehow whatever it is that's in the neem tree makes your teeth better. So th that knowledge is all there and it's just, again, accessing it because nowadays they all think we need to go to a pharmacy and buy Western medicine. And actually, they've got so much on there, you know, just outside their house. So, yeah, and using the neem balm, and we lived with it for ages. I've got, yeah, my two little girls, they spent their whole life climbing trees and getting cuts and scrapes. And, yeah, we were never without neem balm. Um, there we are making it. So with the profits from their, their balms and their batiks, they were able to buy a goat. And as I said before, one thing just leads to another and you, you start seeing growth and you see confidence building, you see independence. They've got their own money. Um, it's very exciting to see. Um, I started working at that time with another group of women um, and this is the Upendo Wamama group, which means mother's love in Swahili. And they're all women who have albinism or have children who have albinism, which some of you have talked to downstairs. It's a genetic skin condition. So you appear white, you've got no pigment in your skin, which obviously is extremely dangerous living in Tanzania. They're working in farms. They've got absolutely no protection from the sun. So life expectancy is about 40 um, because of skin cancer. But more dangerous is the fact that they're treated as inhuman. People say they're ghosts, they're not really human. Uh, they're sought after for their body parts, which will be used in witchcraft potions, which makes children extremely vulnerable um, for, I mean, the bodies would be sold at extremely high prices. So all of these women have gone through, and again, I could speak for a long time about all their stories, which are, they're incredibly resilient women who have been through the most traumatic experiences, um, and they're just inspirational, they really are. But anyway, there they are. Um, they, they'd all come from terrible situations, been cut off from family, cut off from their village, no money, uh, and, and needed income. So that was when it got really exciting joining all the dots together, because I was like, well, we've got all these beekeepers, they don't know what to do with the wax, and now here we've got all these women that need an income, so let's come together. So the women started to buy the wax from the beekeepers, and they would clean it, and then start, we learned to make. And again, I knew nothing about this, and I know there's some beautiful exhibitions downstairs of all the things made out of beeswax. And I have been absolutely fascinated learning about it, but ours is a little more rough and ready than some of the beautiful things downstairs. But they loved it. We all loved it. We were all learning together to make candles. Jenny and Baraka, um, yeah, and Monica. There she is. She's making our nuki sticks, um, which are a takeoff of the American wiki stick. So yarn coated in, in wax, and it's a good sort of play toy, educational learning thing for children. That's Monica. There they all are making bees wraps and shoe polish. Um, yeah, and wood polish. And again, we sell a lot of their wood polish in Zanzibar. Zanzibar has the most beautiful wood carvings and boxes and statues, and they actually buy a lot of our wood polish for their, for their work. There's a bit of a, an array of the, some of the things they've, they've been making. So the batiks, the bees wraps, all kinds of candles. So birthday candles, taper candles, tea lights, and all the different balms. We even do a beard balm now, so, and a bug balm, which sells particularly well to all the Serengeti tourists. Um, they take with it on, on safari. So, um, yeah, it was hugely exciting, really, to, to work with these women. And suddenly, after being told they were worthless, they couldn't do anything, um, they're a curse, um, you know, they should not be in community, um, we should ostracize them, suddenly they had a place in the community and they had a shop. And, and they would stand at that table and sell their products and people would be coming paying money to buy the things they have made, saying, wow, this is beautiful. They've never been told anything like that before. Um, and the confidence that builds in them, it's huge. It's life-changing. Um, it gives me goosebumps. But yeah, it is, it's, it's amazing. And now they can, they can hold their head high and they can take that money home and they can provide for their kids. So they, we started this shop, The Hive, um, and we actually did it just before lockdown, which was the worst possible time to start a shop. But it's, it's going and it's great. They, they process the honey and they process the wax. So they, they buy the honey from the, the, the rural bee 
beekeepers, um, pay them for it, test it, make sure it's good quality, and then they will put it in the jars and label it and sell it there. And there they all are at work um, and selling it. So that sort of gives you a little bit of a picture of taking it all the way from the hive and then to the benefits that, that are handed down. What I did want to just share, um, sort of a before and after, I was going to read you some of, if I can find my paper here, some of the things that people had said um, when we first met them coming to do these groups. And if I have time now, I, I will just read a few. So Maria, she said, I had 10 children, but four died. I married twice. The marriage was a forced marriage, but then the man died. I remarried, but then the second one died. So now I'm a widow. I have many grandchildren to take care of. Since I have no one to provide for the family, I'm teaching my grandchildren to do some small business so that we can get money for family needs. And it is, it, it's heart-wrenching, isn't it? Just the, the, the kind of situations they're in. This is Lucia. When I first got married, my life was very difficult. When I got my second baby, my husband left me with a three-month-old baby. He went to another island. He left me for six months. I had many challenges. But he has come back, and he has asked for my forgiveness. And we are now living peacefully. So again, a little bit of hope there, but ter tragic circumstances. Kulwa. I am Kulwa Charles. I joined a beekeeping group funded by Bees Abroad. I was born in 1993. I've completed Form 4, that's primary school, but due to financial hardship in the family, I couldn't continue. Due to challenges I faced in my family, I found myself pregnant at the age of 15. I have a baby boy who has serious mental problems. He's four years old, but he cannot talk. His father does not take care of us. I'm the one carrying the burden. My boy does not sleep at night. He just cries. It is a big challenge. And there's so many stories like this that are heartbreaking. But now, I want you just to look at if these women. That's those women. <laughs> and they are the most delightful bunch of women you'd ever meet. Um, so, and this is, this is sort of taking it forward a bit. We've had to come back to the UK. Our, our children were of an age where we had to get them into A-levels and GCSEs and university. So our families moved back. Um, but we've trained these trainers over there and they are carrying on the work we've got new projects starting so partnering with bees abroad and this is the the newest project you might have read about the island beekeepers if you read the bbka magazine they did an article a few months about these women they're on a very small island um, on lake victoria very remote but surprisingly it, it's not inaccessible i mean it's about Let's see, how long does it take to get there? If you're on a, on a boat, you could take about eight hours. It's about an eight-hour journey, um, and it's quite an adventurous journey, so if you're up for it, do visit. It is, it's incredible. Um, but, yeah, so about an eight-hour journey to the, to the island. But it's, it's relatively easy for them to put a bucket of honey on the boat and get it back to the mainland, so it's, it can work. So we've started this, this group of women, and they're all wives of fishermen, um, being on an island is the yeah, most common thing to do. But the men follow the fish, okay? So wherever the fish go, the fishermen follow. So they end up leaving their wives and taking all the money with them. Most of it goes on drink and other women. Um, and you've got a woman left behind with eight, ten children struggling to just get enough food for them. So what we're doing is working with these women to get them beekeeping, to give them another income source. And oh, we had so much fun. They're just, I mean, I had no idea of these stories when I met them. I, I visited um, in March and I met all these women for the first time there. Betendi there with the big wave, she's our trainer. So she was the one that started the group off on the, on the ground there. And it wasn't till that evening at the end of the day that Betendi showed me these quotes of what they'd said when they joined up for the group. And I was like, wow. You know, you would never, never know what they come from. And we had so much fun. This is in the village. Oh, yeah, this is Anastasia. She's the, she's the chair of the group. And I mean, you can just see in their faces the fun that they're having. This is life-giving to them. Being part of this group is huge. It's not just about the beekeeping, but that is what we do. But it's, it's all around that. Um, here we are walking out to the hives. Oh, and I didn't fall in the water here, but Betendi did. It was hilarious. I felt kind of, yeah, I'm glad it was her, not me. But <laughs> yeah, we're walking through the rice paddies. Um, and when you're coming back in the dark, it's a very narrow strip that you've got to kind of balance on. And when you've got all your buckets and everything, it's, it's an easy thing to just fall in. There we are exploring the area, seeing what's available for bee forage. 
but here we are. Um, I'll show you this little video, um, just because it sums up the joy that you can have doing this. They'd never worn bee suits before, okay? So if you can just, if you've seen the pictures, they all wear the wrap, the, a piece of fabric just wrapped around, tied up. Flip-flops, barefoot, nothing complicated. Suddenly, we're asking them to put on trousers, which, I, that's men's clothing. You don't wear trousers. Um, trousers, you've got zips, you've got a veil, a hat, you've got gloves. Now, if you can, again, think of if you've ever tried to put gloves on a toddler for the first time, how hard it is to get all the fingers in the right hole. For people that have never worn gloves at all in their entire life, it is quite, it, it took us probably, well, it took us 45 minutes to get everything on. But the longest thing was trying to get all the fingers in the right holes for the gloves. Um, and they're just killing themselves laughing about how funny it is, like wearing these things. And um, yeah, try, and the gum boots, we had like welly boots to put on. They were literally falling over trying to get all this stuff on. And the, looking at each other, they were in hysterics. So it doesn't quite, it's not quite there, but it, the laughter was <laughs> contagious. No, I am a malice. <laughs> that Justina in the middle, she's the new trainer. Yeah. I wish I got the first bit. I couldn't dig my phone out fast enough. But oh, yeah, she was the lady in the orange. <laughs> She couldn't stand up. <laughs> so, yeah, you just see, I mean, the joy and the fun that it is to, to do this is, is incredible. So it's just so much fun. But let me just show you now some of the quotes of some of the women that have talked about their experiences. Now they've been part of the group um, there. So... Um, I can stop asking for support from my husband every time, again and again, and reduce my poverty as I can save some money. For me as a woman, I'm getting joy and happiness from joining, oh, excuse the mistake there, joining the beekeeping group, and it is helping me. With my honey profit, I will help my children go to school to get an education. And one of the ladies said, bees are money, food, and medicine, and they increase our crops. So I hope you can see, oh, there we go, it is really making a difference. Um, it's bringing people together for a very exciting purpose. Um, they're able to provide for their children. You've got honey, crops, trees, businesses, education, health. Um, and there is much more I could say. There's so many more stories I could share. But I do hope that by sharing my story here, you've ca you caught a little bit of my passion, I guess, to see people empowered by beekeeping. Um, in Africa here, it's not a hobby. It's, it's not... It's not a sort of extra thing to do. Like, it's, it's not even about running a successful honey business, although that is, is important and the potential for that is growing more and more. And at Bees Abroad, we're really excited to see how we can develop that business side of things. But it starts before that. It starts very grassroots. It just starts where people are at, making a difference and then watching it grow from there. Um, so yes, yeah, chance of an education it's the, and it's extra meal a day. Um, and this is what Bees Abroad is about, really, um, empowering communities through sustainable beekeeping, creating beekeepers for life, creating beekeeping trainers that will then train others who will train others who will train others. Um, and you've only heard just a few little stories from Tanzania today, but Bees Abroad is working in lots of countries, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, Nepal, um, Nigeria, um, and there are so many more stories um, to, sh to share and so much more to do. So we do invite you all to be part of the story. And I do have to do a little plug for, our, yeah, look us up on the website. Find out more about what we do as Bees Abroad at beesabroad.org.uk. Um, you can sign up there for newsletters to get more stories of what's going on. Um, and, and we do encourage everybody to get involved in whatever way you can. You assumed we all knew what the health benefits of honey were. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but what? Do you feel they were particularly in, in Tanzania? Thank you for picking me up on that, because I did say I would come back to it, but I didn't. So, um, actually, if you watch this space in upcoming um, social media posts, we will be talking a bit about it. But the honey, um, there's, uh, for coughs and colds, for burns, having it available, 
for the propolis. That's another thing we're getting more and more into. And again, that's something um, that's hugely beneficial trying to, and it's, it's, another, it's another thing to do. And we're reaching the stage now where we're doing more and more. In Uganda, they're doing very well with propolis tinctures um, and using that. Um, the wax, um, the women that I'm working with with albinism, obviously horrific skin problems. And so, yeah, making those balms is very yeah medicinal for them. Oh, I did talk a little bit, but yeah, the, the, the medicinal balms from the wax. But yeah, yeah. But we had one project too, I should say, which was in a village called Ngudu, and they had a clinic there uh, in that village. And the doc one of the doctors from that clinic joined our group to become a beekeeper. And he was uh, hugely interested in how we could work with the clinic. And again, I think that's something we need to do more and we need to do better, connecting with, with those people to see how we can really make the most of using honey. Because there's, I mean, there's so much you could do with it and more than we are doing, yeah. What is the temperament of the bees? Ah, I didn't go into that too much. I thought I'd really put you all off. But <laughs> they, yes, they are known for being, um, a, we like to say defensive, but yes, quite offensive. <laughs> but yeah, no, but having said that, I've had so many experiences where they have all been quite calm. Um, and it's been fine. But when they, I mean, there's been lots of studies done that prove how aggressive they can be just in the, their alarm time. You know, if, if, if there's a, I think the time here from when the alarm goes out to be the, the bees coming out is quite long. Whereas there, I think it's like milliseconds, you know, poof, they're there. And you, and you do have to work quickly because of that. You're sort of very aware, we need to close up shop and get out of here fairly quickly. Um, so yeah, we have had some crazy adventures where, and you can't get rid of them, they do, they chase you. And, and, it, and it can take hours, like once I was, you, you circle a tree, you basically go to a tree and go round and round the tree until they get the point and go. By that point, they're dizzy, I'm dizzy, and you're, you're so hot and sweaty, you don't, yeah. But, and then one time I remember I lost my car keys, the, I had the Land Cruiser keys in my pocket, and you're kind of bending over, trying to like lose all the bees, and my keys must have fallen out of the pocket. So we get back, and I didn't have the keys, and I'd like, I'd been around every tree. So then I had to go back around every tree and find my keys. But yeah, and we had, we did lose a bee keeper once um, we were yeah we, we were it got really bad and and he ran away <laughs> and um, so I was like we need to stop so uh, me and the, the other trainer we were basically closing up the hive as quickly as we could everybody was very scared at that point and then it was Bageshi he'd gone and we were all shouting Bageshi Bageshi and in the end I was like we'll get back in the Land Cruiser and we'll just start driving farther afield and we did we started driving on the road out and there we saw Bageshi he was like like pedaling like mad in his bee suit and, he, and we're like well, whose bike is it? He's like I don't know I stole it <laughs> and he was just pedaling as fast as he could to get out of there but uh, yeah see if I say too many of these stories you'll you'll be far too put off but yeah that is one of the reasons we started doing it at night and we didn't lose any beekeepers then either. <laughs> um, do you, did you find that doing bee in the inspections in the night that the bees are sli slightly different mm. temperament? Very, yeah, well, they're asleep, <laughs> which is always, yeah, they're very quiet. And unless you, I mean, we did have occasions when somebody would turn on their, their, their torch, white torch, and as soon as you've done that, poof, they're all awake, and it's, yeah, it gets a little bit more difficult. But yeah, when, it, when, it's, when it's dark and it's just the red light, it's, the problem is it's very full, because obviously all the bees have come home for the night, so it's a lot, Busier, you know, it, it's hard to, to maneuver everything because you've got lots of bees. So if you're taking out a comb, it's covered. You know, you are brushing off a lot of bees. But yeah, no, generally much easier. Yeah, except for when it rains, and then it gets it gets very tricky because when you've got bees that are asleep and wet, they stick to you and don't go anywhere. So we all came back. I remember we had a whole load of us, and we were fine as long as we were dark and wet. But then as soon as we went into the, and I don't know again why we did this, again, you learn by making mistakes, and this was a big mistake. We went into somebody's house, and again, I don't know why we did that, because we were all fine, it was all calm, the bees were all totally still. But then of course with the light, and we started drying off, all the bees woke up, and then the house was full of bees. So yeah, that, we learned a lot that night. And it, it literally took us, I don't know, three hours to, to all calm down, yeah, because it was very wet outside, it was a torrential storm, so 
yeah, we were very wet, stung, tired. <laughs>